In the late 1970s, a young, angelic-looking teenager with flowing blonde hair took the music world by storm. Leif Garrett shot instantly to fame with his boyish charms and feel-good pop hits like I Was Made For Dancing. Seemingly overnight, his smiling face was plastered on the walls for teenage girls everywhere as he became the poster child for bubblegum pop and teen idol movements. But as the 80s progressed, he struggled to be taken seriously as an adult musician, and his squeaky clean image began to tarnish as he grappled with substance abuse issues and repeated run-ins with the law. Facts First presents the sad reasons you don't see Leif Garrett these days. Child star turned teen icon Leif Garrett's showbiz career began early. Born in 1961, he entered the industry as a child actor. At just five years old, with roles in movies like Bob and Carol and Ted and Alice, and TV shows such as Gunsmoke. As the cute, toe-headed boy next door, Garrett won over audiences. Then, when he reached his mid-teens, he pivoted to music, signing with Atlantic Records in 1977. His early hits were covers of retro pop songs like Dion's Runaround Sue and the Beach Boys' Surfin' USA. These remakes aligned with Garrett's fresh-faced California dream and image. In 1978, Scotty Brothers Records sought to amplify his teen appeal. Soon after, he landed his biggest single, the cheerful dance tune, I Was Made For Dancing, which peaked at number 4 in the UK and number 10 on the Billboard Hot 100. More hits followed, like Feel The Need and Same Goes For You. They catered directly to his rapidly growing fan base of young girls. By May 1979, the 17-year-old even hosted his own TV special, Leaf, with A-list guests like Marie Osmond and Flip Wilson. The car crash that changed everything. In November 1979, Garrett's world collapsed. After a night of drinking and drugs, the 18-year-old crashed his car at high speed. The accident didn't just end his charmed streak, it almost cost Garrett's passenger, friend and dancer Roland Winkler, his life. Winkler was paralyzed and would require round-the-clock care for the rest of his days. Garrett emerged relatively unscathed physically, but was consumed by guilt. In the aftermath, Winkler sued and won almost $7 million from insurance companies. Garrett also had to pay $15,000. But it wasn't the financial toll that haunted Garrett. It was the knowledge that his reckless behavior had forever altered Winkler's future. In a 1999 episode of VH1's Behind the Music, Garrett cried as he reunited with Winkler, who harbored no ill will. Still, Garrett spiraled into heroin and cocaine abuse, later calling that fateful November night the beginning of the end. While he managed a few minor hits in the early 80s, his music career skidded off the rails. Acting gigs dried up too. He was on a slide into addiction, bankruptcy, and legal troubles. Spiraling Addiction and Arrests As Garrett's stardom evaporated in the 80s, his drug issues mushroomed. He later admitted to using substances as early as age 14 to help cope with industry pressures and a turbulent home life. In his memoir, Idle Truth, Garrett also suggested the deceitful nature of his heavily produced musical career fueled his teenage desire to self-medicate. By 1997, his heroin addiction was full-blown. An arrest that year for cocaine possession presaged over a decade of serial drug busts and failed rehab stints. When Garrett appeared on Behind the Music, it seemed like he'd finally beaten his demons. But shortly thereafter, when undercover cops busted the former icon trying to buy heroin and cocaine, his publicity comeback crumbled. More arrests followed in the 2000s until Garrett ended up in court-mandated rehab programs. Each time Garrett resolved to get clean, but eventually he relapsed into heroin abuse. His haggard mugshots relayed the crushing depths of his addiction. By 2010, he'd been convicted multiple times on drug possession charges related to heroin and cocaine. His perpetual cycle of rehab and recidivism continued as family and former fans looked on aghast at his demise. He hits rock bottom. With his fortunes and fame long gone, Garrett leaned on his mother as his sole means of financial support in the 2000s. By 2001, the one-time magazine cover boy had hit rock bottom. He filed for bankruptcy, claiming just $350 in assets outside of some spare clothes. Buried under $76,000 of debt after years of unrestrained drug use, the former star was unequivocally broke and broken. Yet even as he languished in obscurity, Garrett continued to make headlines for drug arrests throughout the decade. Each time his name resurfaced in the press, 
It wasn't tied to music or acting, just the latest sad twist in his downward spiral. His repeated failure to complete court-mandated rehab programs resulted in a 90-day jail sentence in 2006. In 2010, Garrett reached possibly his lowest ebb when he was caught lying to police about hiding black tar heroin in his shoe. At the time, celebrity rehab's Dr. Drew was attempting to counsel a weathered Garrett back to the sobriety on season four of his show, but producers allegedly sabotaged the process by urging the notoriously addicted Garrett to use on camera. He later said the televised treatment was merely exploitative rather than a good-faith attempt to rehabilitate him. The Quiet Aftermath Following the chaos of the 90s and 2000s, Garrett has lived relatively quietly, shedding the regular tabloid coverage of his arrests. But near-lifelong drug abuse has left the former star changed. The vibrant, grinning teen idol ceased to exist long ago. Instead, the media found a prematurely aged Garrett almost unrecognizable as his former self. No longer able to rely on famous friends or royalty checks, Garrett turned to one enduring source of support, his mother. After kicking Garrett out of her home during the depths of his addiction, Stellar eventually reconciled with her son. They repaired their relationship just before stage 4 lung cancer claimed Stellar's life in 2022 at age 88. Today, Garrett continues to lie low, while occasionally musing on his extraordinary rise to fame and grim crash back to earth. He often outlines the predatory, profit-driven nature of the entertainment machine that chewed him up and spat him out. In happier news, he's notably remained sober since his last drug conviction. He chooses to keep a wide berth from industry temptation rather than choose any parallel career resurgence at age 63. Outside of work touring with the 1960s Oldies Review, the erstwhile star eschews major publicity. Instead, he seems to find peace in small pleasures, candid fan interactions, minor acting gigs, and time spent with lifelong girlfriend Elaine Bilstead prior to her untimely death in 1999. He generally abstains from mining faded glory or rehashing his past misdeeds. He appears content to live out his days as an echo of his former self rather than the drug-addled celebrity the tabloids once hounded. Behind the headlines of drugs and decline, aspects of his legacy are obscure. For example, while his polished pop hits topped charts, he didn't actually possess exceptional singing ability at the time. Producers brought in studio vocalist Jim Haas to handle tricky tracks the adolescent Garrett couldn't quite master. On songs like Surfing USA, Haas essentially replaced Garrett, who felt increasingly like a fraud fronting inauthentic records. And as rap sheets replaced record sales, Garrett's nosedived notoriety established a template for celebrities whose rebellious antics generate headlines. Now it's time to hear from you. What's your favorite memory of Leaf Garrett? Let us know in the comments section below.